So I just started learning about Svelte for the first time, and I wanted to try to build something that would help uh, codify some of those understandings in my brain. So I decided to build a JSON Explorer. I built something extremely similar to this back in Angular 9 days. So I had a good uh, mental model from which to start building. And the idea here is we have this input, and we can just start typing or pasting in a JSON expression. So I could say true, and if I do command enter, you'll see it'll parse that string that, uh, you know, this is just an input, so it's always a string. It'll parse that string into a native data structure and render it. And we get true, we get hello. You can see that's a string that the previous was a Boolean. We could do numbers. Um, and then we can start to get more complex. So we could have an array. We could say A, B, C. And you can see that we're rendering this array recursively. So we're rendering the top element. And then, of course, for each one of the elements inside the array, we're rendering it uh, to its own node here. And we could, of course, make this even more complex. We could say values. And we could turn that into an object that contains a values array. So this object is now being rendered recursively. Um, and if we look at the URL, you can see that this value is being persisted. Uh, this JSON string is being encoded as base64, and it's being persisted to the URL. So if I refresh, you'll see that we actually get the same exact value. And if there's a value present in the URL, it automatically gets parsed and rendered. So this way you can actually copy and share a URL with someone else over Slack or however you might share with people. By default here, you'll see if I remove this, I am populating the input with this uh, test data, and that's just to give me something to, to work with as I was building this out. And you can see it's a fairly complex, but not overly complex data structure. Um, as I click on labels here, you can see that I can collapse and expand entire parts of this subtree. Furthermore, if I have an embedded string value that represents JSON, I can double click on that and have it get parsed. So here you can see I have a string that has a created and an offset property. And if I double click on this, you'll see that that is now parsed from a string into an object that has the created and offset. Now, obviously, if it's not a valid JSON, nothing happens. I'm double clicking here and it's not like this is throwing an error or, a, or parsing in some weird way. So let's take a look at how this works behind the scenes because it's a small app, but it has some advanced features for the, for the size of the app here, including the fact um, that if this is wrong, I have a, uh, an error message that gets rendered here. This is going to use content projection. This uses a custom input, so to speak. This uses a recursive data structure. This uses each base bindings. There's a, there's a lot to be had here. So let's just take a quick look. I'm not going to go too deep into the code since I have it in the blog post, but let's just do a quick rundown here. So if we jump into the root component, uh, the root component when it mounts, it looks in the URL to see if it can get a, a JSON payload. And if it does, it will parse it and render the DOM tree. Um, but if we scroll down to the actual component itself, you can see that the component is actually quite simple, that the root level component here is doing very little except orchestrating the data flow out of the input and into the recursive JSON explorer. The um, and then if there's an error message, it gets rendered here. Let's take a look at the error message first because it's super simple. If you see, if I have a parsing error here, I'm passing it as the children, the content children, the tag body, essentially, to this set of tags. Internally, we're going to use this content and project it into a slot. So if we look at the JSON error, you can see that I have a default slot here. That is, I have an unnamed slot, and I can provide default content for the error. But what's going to happen is that when I render the error message, this value here is actually going to get overwritten with the value that I'm passing through as the error. So that's cool. Content projection seems pretty straightforward in Svelte. And you can name these things. You can have multiple content projections inside of a Svelte component. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. So what else can we look at? The JSON input. Uh, one thing that is really nice about Svelte is just how easy it makes two-way data binding. Uh, there are a lot of people in the front-end world who hate on two-way data binding, but they are misguided. Two-way data binding for form elements is just magical, and Svelte makes it quite painless. Uh, we can do the bind value 
directive here. And what that says is we want to create a two-way data binding between the value prop on this element and the JSON payload variable within this component. That's the thing that I'm passing around when I want to parse. So if we look at JSON input and we look at the value, what you'll see at the top here is that I'm actually exporting the value. So when we look at this, let me close this error message. We're done with that one. When we look at the bind value here, what we're saying is bind to the value prop and the value prop is exactly what we're exporting here within our JSON input. Now, internally to this component, if we scroll down to the, to the HTML, what you'll see is that I have my native text area element and I'm using two way data binding here between my internal value property and the value of the text area itself. So this is actually really cool here because essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating two way data binding internally to this component, but this component is exposing this value as a prop and then Svelte is seamlessly creating two way data binding between the JSON payload in this value, the value prop here, and then inside of my Svelte input, the value that's being attached to the text area. So we're creating this multi level component two way data binding, which allows me to extract that value from the internal text area. It's really, it's really clever. I mean, it's really clean. It just feels really good. It's it, that's really well done. I have to uh, appreciate that. And then as we would do with other front end frameworks, when I want to parse, I'm going to handle the key down here and you'll see that that just calls this a uh, form submission and the form submission, uh, emits a custom event called explore and it includes the value of the text area. The root component is then going to listen for that explore event and then parse this value or attempt to parse this value into a JSON string. And if we go back into our root component, um, you can see here it's listening for that custom explore event. And if it does, it calls handle explore. And if we pop up here, uh, that custom event, you'll see, um, causes us to then parse this JSON payload. Now I don't need to actually pull anything out of the event itself because we have that, that multi-level two-way data binding that's actually binding the value of that internal text area to this JSON payload. So I can just parse this payload directly. I don't have to worry about say like pulling out of the event dot detail. And if it parses successfully, uh, it gets parsed into this parsing result and you'll see down below here, that is what I am passing into my JSON Explorer. Um, one thing that did kind of rub me the wrong way is all of this constant scrolling up and down. Uh, I, I'm, I'm honestly not a fan of these single file components. Now you could probably say, oh, the style block should be at the bottom. That's a personal preference. That doesn't seem like something I should have to do in order to solve this problem. Or you could say like I could collapse this and yeah, it's a little bit less to scroll. But in general, I just, I wasn't a huge fan of this. I much prefer having my my code behind my style and my HTML all broken out into three separate files that all represent a single component. That's a personal preference. It just feels like a lot of friction to, to have to jump all over the place within the files. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, if we look at JSON Explorer, we're going to be rendering this parsing result. And if we jump back into the browser, that's, that's this thing here. That's this parse data structure and all of this goodness down here. That's in the JSON Explorer. But the JSON Explorer really doesn't do much. What it's going to do is just kick off that recursive rendering. So if we look at the JSON Explorer, you can see that it exposes that value property. So that's what we're binding to is that JSON parsing result. And internally, all it does is call this JSON node element or render this JSON node element and pass in that root value, that, that parsing result from our JSON string. This JSON node is then going to render itself recursively as it crawls um, through this complex data structure. So, you know, if, it, if it, it has an object, it then has to recursively render the key and the value. The value then might be a simple value like a number of string, which would represent our base case and, and stop that recursive algorithm. Or it could represent a much more complex object like an array, in which case we then have to start recursing over the array itself, which has its own elements that need to be rendered recursively, and which may even have other complex data structures like this object inside this array element inside this object entry, and that has to be rendered recursively as well.
So let's take a quick look at that. There's a lot of code that's in this node, this JSON node Svelte component. Um, so again, I'm not gonna go too deeply into it, but essentially what happens is every time the value comes in, we get the type, the array Boolean null number object string. And then if we go down to the code, and there's a lot of style, and I gotta jump over here. Essentially, I'm looking at the value type, and then I'm just rendering a label and a value based on that type. There's a good deal of repeated code here, and I, and I probably could have collapsed the null case, the string case, the Boolean, um, and the number all into kind of a single pattern where maybe I could have dynamically added the class to say that this one's a number and this one's a Boolean. But there was something nice about seeing them all explicitly rendered in the HTML, even if it had a lot of repeated stuff. But essentially, you can see I have my label and then I have my value. In this case, it's a null. I have my label. I have my value. In this case, it's a dynamic expression. On the string, uh, here I do have to add that double click binding so that I can get that, uh, that on the fly parsing, right? If we refresh here, remember that this is just a string, but if I double click, that gets parsed into its own JSON, uh, that gets parsed into its own sub object. And again, that's a nice, that's a nice reason that I have these all broken out individually. It would have become weird to have to then add special bindings. I don't know. It, it's nice to have things broken apart. Sometimes duplication isn't really duplication. It's just the same code repeated. Um, the, the exciting part here gets down to the, the complex objects, the arrays and the object, because not only do I have to add a new element here, which is the header, that's the, uh, the, this part, right? The simple values don't have headers. They just have labels and values, but arrays have headers, objects have headers. So I have an additional header here. But then I also have my sub elements. And when I get to my sub elements, so I'm looping over the array and I have to start rendering the values of the array recursively. So I have the index one, two, three, four, five, etc. And then inside the value, I have this Svelte self. Svelte self is a special element provided by the Svelte framework, which says whatever component I'm in right now, that's what this component represents. So I'm actually calling the JSON node component recursively here, and I'm passing in the sub value of the array as the value for this node to render. And you'll see in the object entries, I'm doing the same thing. I'm recursively calling this component and passing in the sub value in the object. Um, one thing that I did not love about Svelte is that if you look at the click handlers, uh, you'll see that it's not a function invocation. It is a function reference that I have to provide. I'm not calling the toggle method. I'm providing the toggle method reference. And then at runtime, when I click on this, Svelte will invoke this method for me, which means that it becomes very challenging to provide in the context of an each iteration a argument to this toggle because the argument uh, I can't do something like say toggle sub value index because that expression here gets executed at render time it doesn't actually get rendered or it doesn't actually get um, executed when I click it gets executed as the each is unfolding and what gets passed to click is the result of this so I can't do that and what I see a lot of people do on Google is they'll do something like this, where I'm not actually invoking this, I'm creating an inline function expression that gets used as the click handler. And to me, this is just super ugly. Um, it feels really weird. I, I don't care for it. I didn't care for it in React. Uh, I don't care for it uh, in other languages that, that seem to want to use that style of code. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm providing the index here as a data attribute because this binding will work inside the context of each. But then if we look at the toggle method, can I just jump to it? You'll see that I look at the target of the event and then I look in the data set, which is gets populated by those data dash attributes. And I'm looking to see if toggle index exists. If it doesn't exist, I know that I'm toggling the root node at this particular part of the subtree. And if it does exist, I know that I'm toggling a, a, a sub entry. And that's how I differentiate between say something like the single node and the entry node. 
anyway, so I didn't I didn't love that. Um, but there's clearly a lot to really like about Svelte. There's some really great decisions that it makes, and and then there's some decisions that I just don't personally care for. But that's really what a framework is. It's a, it's a composite or an aggregation of trade offs that it does some things at the expense of other things. And the framework that you go with is ultimately the one that makes the right set of trade offs for your particular style and your particular needs. And, uh, you know, I may be dead wrong on some of the stuff I'm saying here. I'm just learning Svelte for the first time. This is actually the first time I've ever written Svelte code. Uh, so hopefully I didn't get it too wrong. But um, I don't know. It, it's cool. There's definitely a lot of cool stuff in Svelte. And, and some of the things that it makes easy, it makes really easy. Like that, uh, that two-way data binding across components. That's just really painless. But uh, yeah, hopefully there's something in here that is interesting. And uh, hopefully I'll have some more Svelte stuff coming out.